Um, okay, so today we're going to be um, taking a, a bit of an inter, interlude um, on our coverage of uh, profunctors. Um, we've gone through sort of five sessions on profunctors and um, leading up to, uh, to, to wrapping up the story on profunctor optics, these um, extremely useful mechanisms that uh, see roles in, um, in databases and game theory and dynamical systems in programming um, and uh, in which uh, are gonna play an outsized role when it comes to the next session of our course, um, uh, which is gonna be on dynamical systems. Um, but before I get to that, I, because it, it bears on this issue of wiring diagrams, I, I wanted to talk about wiring diagrams and uh, we'll return Friday is my plan to, um, to finish up that story, which is a fairly advanced story about how these these uh, profunctors, uh, profunctor optics can be described categorically. It's neat, but it's, it definitely is gonna stretch everyone, including myself. But um, uh, before doing that, I, I did wanna talk about uh, wiring diagrams and associated symmetric monoidal categories. This too is a topic which is at once uh, has great theoretical depth, but on the other hand, is enormous practical import. Uh, uh, Xiao Yan is working with a uh, modeling system, practical, runnable um, uh, modeling system uh, for dynamical systems, uh, which is built around uh, symmetric monoidal categories and wiring diagrams and uses them to illustrate models. Um, and uh, there's a, a wide range of sort of very practical uses of applied category theory where these wiring diagrams uh, become very useful. And in fact, they are going to be absolutely central for our next discussion of dynamical systems because we'll characterize dynamical systems using wiring diagrams um, and they'll be associated with symmetric mineral categories and they'll have a, a, a sort of syntactic form um, in terms of text but also a syntactic form in terms of the diagrams, um, which is captured by wiring diagrams. So um, I did want to hit on this and I hit on this pretty hard and it turns out it's, it's kind of playing a role with the, the profunctor optics as well, particularly in understanding prisms, for example, uh, or understanding uh, lenses, these diagrams um, are, are quite useful. So wiring diagrams are a sort of variant of, of, of string diagrams and um, uh, more focused on the syntactic side wiring diagrams, uh, but they're really tied in, in ways that are at once practical, useful, beautiful, um, very interesting with symmetric mineral categories. So a few key themes here, symmetric mineral categories, uh, those that have a monoidal operation, which is symmetric. So A tensor B is the same as B tensor A um, and have a number of other nice properties like a unit for tensoring, that when you tensor it with anything else gives you the other thing back. Um, turns out these are useful for formalizing visual reasoning about equivalence and wiring diagrams. And, we can kind of look at a wiring diagram and read off a set of equations or equation in, in symmetric mineral categories. And we'll see this quite a bit with the dynamical systems components, the pro excuse me, the um, uh, polynomial functors approach that we'll be getting to shortly next week. And it turns out that symmetric mineral categories um, that the rules that we capture with them in this kind of formalism are exactly the rules that make what would otherwise be ambiguities within these wiring diagrams um, moot in the sense that it doesn't 
matter which of the ambiguous interpretations you use because they are they are the same in some deep sense. Um, so you can rest assured that there's not a wrong way to read this diagram. Um, there's one way, but you can understand it through several different pathways, come to the same essential answer. Uh, so uh, they are ambiguous, but in a way that, um, that doesn't pose any problems. Uh, and that adds to mental flexibility for thinking about them, it can add to intuition. And um, it turns out, at a deeper level we won't get to today, wiring diagrams are morphisms and categories. In fact, these diagrams form morphisms in what are known as hypergraph categories. And as morphisms, they, they compose. Um, and uh, they also play a key role in operads where they compose by nesting. So like, and, and we'll, we'll see this right at the end that like you can substitute one wiring diagram into another and get a resulting wiring diagram. And that's kind of like composing one morphism with another. Um, and it turns out that nesting obeys nice rules um, uh, in, in terms of, um, the orderliness of it. So to understand symmetric monoidal categories, it's probably not a bad thing to just remind ourselves um, that when we're talking about monoids, um, we're talking about a, uh, a collection that has some way of combining things, a tensor operation written here in a unit. Now, the most basic case of this is we have a set S, so the classic monoid, and we have this tensor operation, which can be used to combine any two elements of S to yield a, another element of S. And it's closed under this. So any two of the elements in S can be combined to get a resulting element in S. And um, uh, there's uh, this unit element, um, E, shown as E here, it'll, it'll sort of, sort of be written as I later. Um, I'm going to wave my hands at that. I, 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 with no pun intended, I, this is a slight difference probably that I'm not grokking, but basically there'll be a thing called I, which serves the same function, um, the identity element or the unit element. And what's notable about it is when you combine it with any other element of S, you get that other element back. So you tensor it with anything else, right? Um, uh, and, and it's associative, so parentheses don't matter. Um, again, like you could say, well, it could be parenthesized in either of these ways. And, and the, the truth is, yeah, it's ambiguous, but it doesn't matter because they give the same answer. That's very much that the flavor of where we're going with these with wiring diagrams. Um, you could put the parentheses any which way you like. And if you like thinking about it one way or the other, it'll give the same answer. Um, and E can be, can be combined, I'll sometimes say multiplied by this thing on either side, left or right, and you get the same answer back. And there's a whole set of examples of these, right? And like the natural numbers and plus and zero. Um, we can add any two naturals together, get another natural. If we add zero to any other number, we get that other number back. Or we can have, the naturals and times in one. So here, the plus was the way of combining. Here, the times is the way of combining. And we have a different unit, uh, depending on which one we do. We could have max with zero in the naturals, um, which is not, uh, not a bad idea. Uh, um, let me ask this. Uh, if you add, add this with the naturals, could you have a, a minimum? Are we allowed infinity as the unit? Okay, so that's the question. And infinity is not technically a member of the natural. So you would have to, you'd have to say infinity, like union of naturals and the set consisting of infinity. And then you could have infinity because the min of infinity and anything else is that other thing, right? You take the minimum of, uh, 
a billion and infinity, you get a billion. Um, take the 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 um, minimum of uh, a Google and infinity, you get a Google back. Um, when I was young, um, uh, the Google was a number, and there was a Google Plex, which is a number with a Google number of zeros after it. Um, um, I think that's been taken over as a term now. Um, not many people remember that, I think. Um, but we have these things with Booleans too, right? It's not just um, naturals. We give them with reals. We have them with power sets where we union things, right? Um, monoids are all around us. And, um, and you know, they have this property of combining and this, this distinguished element, which when you combine it with anything else, you get other, that other thing back. Um, they have many forms, but they all are sort of variants of this, this form. Many, many particular faces, but they're all variants. And monoids in programming are all around us, right? We want to fold up a bunch of numbers by combining each one to get a summary. We do it with plus, or we do it with times, or we do it with min, or we do it with max, or whatever. And we're using these, these monoids. Um, and more advanced languages uh, with better type systems, monoids are broken out in, in Haskell, for example. Um, and it turns out that monoids play this really, they're like, you keep on coming back to monoids. You can't escape monoids um, within applied category theory. And we're gonna be talking about them here with respect to parallel operations, something you've seen in previous lectures, um, uh, but also, you know, more generally with, with these wiring diagrams. And you kind of saw cameos of them there. The, the thing that's a bit confusing is there's a category monoid, um, which has a single object and a bunch of um, morphisms. Each morphism represents a particular element of the set of the monoid. Um, that's one manifest, that's one way monoids come into the discussion. Another way is we have a category of monoids or them objects are monoids and you have these mappings between them, which are structure preserving mappings. That's what morphisms are in a category of structure preserving mappings. And they, um, and, and they're, uh, they're monoid homomorphisms. They kind of map one monoid to another in a well-behaved way. Um, so identity becomes identity, composition is preserved. Uh, this, so there's this category of monoids. Um, there's monoidal categories, categories which has this monoidal structure, which is close to what we're, which is really what we'll be talking about today. And then there's a monoid in such a monoidal category, one that has this monoidal structure. It's enough to make your head spin sometimes, but basically they're that important that they have all these different manifestations. And they're that useful that they have these manifestations in programming and mathematics. Okay, so monoids are great. What's not to love about them? They're fantastic. So we'll talk about these monoidal categories. Uh, so we talk about a category having strict monoidal structure if, if these things are true. So it has one of these ways of combining any two objects to get another object. Pick any two objects, you combine them with this tensor and you'll get another one back. Um, and it turns out tensor is a, it's a functor. Um, so this is not merely like a set mapping. It's it's like a so it's a functor from this product category. So you have a product category of C cross C. It's this category where all the objects are object of C paired with an object of C. And the, the this is a, a functor. It's called a bifunctor, and it maps from that product category back into C. Um, and the bifunctor um, is a functor. And you may say, well, look, why is that just a, a dumb function? Why does it have to be a fancy functor? Um, and a functor, though, does something besides mapping objects. What else does it do? What else does a functor map besides mapping objects to objects? It maps. More, more. Sorry, can can you hear me? I, I yeah, said now I can hear you. Morphisms. It maps morphisms. That's right. 
that's that's right. Metamorphosis. Good, good. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, monoidal product. Um, uh, it a category if it has this bifunctor that does this thing and, and it's a functor, so it maps morphisms and it preserves their composition and it maps. You know, it, it, there's a mapping of identity to identity and it plays nicely and um, beautiful things. That, that, that's an out, that that's one of the things that's needed for a strict monodal structure. But then there needs to be this special object in this category i that serves as the unit object and the way we talk about it categorically we don't like to talk about elements of this thing so we say there's a there's a functor from the the, the one you the one object category into c and what does that functor do well it, it's only one object to map in this one object category it's a single object right and it, just maps that object to some object in C. Okay, so it names some object in C. That's why it's the same as just saying we name an object in C. Um, pick your way of expressing it. it. It's basically just saying this in element I in C, although here it's treated as a morphism, as a functor. Um, we often sort of uh, don't pay that much attention to it, but it's nice that we can define it this way. Um, and that allows us to compose it with other things and other nice, nice things. And it, but the key is it has to observe these properties. It has this so-called data that observe, that has some regular properties. And what are these regular properties? Well, you see them here. Um, and there's associativity and unitality. And the fact that these are equalities means that this is a strict monoidal category. See. C cross I, C tensor I is equal to C. It's equal to, it's exactly equal to. Um, and that's nice, but sometimes we'd like something looser than that. We don't, we wanna be able to have a structure where this isn't necessarily equal, it's more accommodating. Like maybe we have a structure where there are, you know, parentheses, and and we just say as long as it's isomorphic, it, it doesn't matter if we have, you know, a comma b comma c, or if we have a comma b comma c, um, or or you know, a and b comma c, um, with the parentheses according to where I put my emphasis, um, th they're all the same. They're just same same information. We could just map losslessly between one and the other. Um, those sort of things you might say, well, there's a natural isomorphism and it's a strong monoidal category. And there's natural transformations and it's a lax monoidal category. And it turns out lax monoidal categories are gonna link in with applicatives, which are these kind of weaker versions or weaker cousins of monads. Um, uh, and so we have lax monoidal functors being kind of uh, basically equivalent to, um, to applicatives. You can, given one, you can implement the other and vice versa. Um, uh, so um, strict monoidal categories are useful. We often, here we're dealing with, with symmetric monoidal categories. So this, for the strict version, this would add a symmetry property so if you do C1 tensor C2, it's the same as C2 tensor C1. Okay, great, but that's still strict because it is this equal. Um, now, uh, in general, we don't want to adhere to this. Um, or we don't want to be that strict. We want to allow some, some accommodation for these things which aren't exactly equal. And programming is filled with all sorts of things where the types are not exactly equal you know, uh, 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 a triple is not exactly the same type as um, a nested pair in either direction, but we want to be able to consider them, you know, basically the same. Um, uh, they're, they're the same. So what is a symmetric monoidal category? Well, it's a, it's a category um, that has a monoidal product uh, that's a bifunctor. Yeah, nothing. Different here is a 
functivore from one to this category, um, which is basically just an object pit from the, the category. But it has these natural isomorphisms. So I won't go into this, but basically, you know, given I cross uh, cross X, given I tensor X, it's basically the same as X. And again, in types, like if you take a singleton type um, uh, in in Haskell uh, and um, like unit. Um, begin paren, end paren, and you tensor it, you put it in a pair with another type, int. Um, there's no more information than an int. So we say it's basically an int. I mean, there's this int and this thing that just doesn't change. There's no possible values. It's just hanging around like a bump on a log. And um, there's no, you know, there's no added information there. So basically we have an int. It's got this weird appendage that's just vestigial. Um, uh, and so it's basically an int. And we can map between them in a natural isomorphic way. Given one, we can create the other. And we can do the same thing on the other side. And we can associate these things and not worry about parentheses by just mapping one from the other. And we can swap between them. So an int, a pair of an int and real is not the same thing as a or say int and double is not the same thing as a double and int. Uh, Type-wise, the, the Java compiler won't, won't treat them the same, but essentially we can define a mapping that's lossless and preserves the information. They have the same information, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. That's all we need for a symmetric monodal category. So it's really easy to secure this within you know, Haskell or, or other languages. This has much nicer, much broader generality than something like this, where it has to be strict. Um, so we give ourselves some wiggle room. Um, and uh, it turns out there's these, these coherence laws um, uh, for these to be kind of well-behaved in a, in a nice way um, uh, that we actually saw in the discussion group. I won't go into this, but essentially, you know, if you take the product of anything with with i with with taking an id for something else and you multiply them, you you get back something that's identical to just the original thing, uh, et cetera. Um, so anyway, symmetric monodal category has these nice nice properties. So here we go with wiring diagrams. This is kind of the 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 textual formalism behind this all. And this may look, you know, arbitrary and kind of baroque, but it gives us these really nice properties when it comes to wiring diagrams or, or string diagrams. Um, and we can basically translate things written in this language with tensors and these trends and stuff like that into things written in this language. So unitality proper, well, okay. So combining two things here is kind of written like this. This is a, here a, a, a string diagram language. We'll see the block diagram version of this. But um, here, this is like X cross X mapped to X. This is kind of the, the wiring diagram form of it rather than a string. I think this will be called more of the string diagram. This is the wiring diagram. A tensor B, um, um, you know, is, is we're mapping from A tensor B, the, the sort of parallel product of these um, uh, into C. You know, there's something that's a result of tensoring these, and we're mapping that into C. Um, so basically, we're we're dealing with the same thing here. Um, Ada. Ada is associated with this, and, and we're, we're just kind of picking out a, a unit element here. And if we combine it with any other, if we tensor it with any other, this unit, um, we'll get that other thing back. It's just equal to, as if we didn't combine it with unit. Um, it's just like this straight wire. It's as if 
we just paid attention to this. We weren't horsing around by combining it with this. Associativity looks like this, where we, we sort of reshuffle. Um, so we can do it in terms of these parens, you know, shuffling the parens from this side to this side. But a kind of nice visual way is you, if you imagine this being X, Y, and Z, we just kind of change from X and Y being grouped multiplied by Z. Um, see, I'm falling into multiply um, to uh, X tensor, Y tensor Z uh, here. Um, that's the associativity property. And what this is saying is, you know, that doesn't matter whether we, we reduce it this way or that way. Um, and commutivity, well, we allow this kind of thing with crossings. And um, it doesn't matter if we have A, B, and then we treat them as multiplying B times A, we get the same thing as if we had just done A times B. Um, so these kind of nice properties can be translated into this context, in this visual context. And with wiring diagrams, we have this kind of block diagram notation that I find as an engineer rather uh, pleasing, um, appealing, and not least familiar. Um, you know, the absence of a block is just like an identity block. Um, uh, here we have this mapping from A cross B into C. Um, okay, now here we have composition and we write it as F composed with G. Um, ooh, ooh, um, sorry, F and then G. Sorry, um, it's not F circle, open circle in G. No, 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 no. That would be G open circle and F if we want to get that, that ordering that G comes after F. Said this is F followed by G. Okay, so we're, if these says mappings. Um, so when we have a parallel thing, we have tensor. When we have a serial thing, a successive thing, we have this, this, um, compo uh, this, this, uh, you know, uh, successive, uh, this um, followed by that or composition. This is really, comp you know, uh, G circle F. Um, it's just composing them. We just have a nicer way to write it in this order visually. Uh, so this is composition when we have the serial combination. Parallel combination is tensor. Um, and you can start to build these up. Um, and so, you know, one way, a good way to interpret this is um, what we have here is F tensor G. Um, we have F needing input A and outputting A prime. We have G needing B and outputting B prime. And we're tensoring them together. Um, fair enough. And we could put these together. Um, so we saw this where they compose. We saw this where they are tensored. So we should start to be, and we saw this was tensoring them. So we should start to be able to do this. Hey, you know, this component is just this. So whatever this is, we should be able to write F tensor G, right? Um, and then it is composed with H. H is then applied. And so we have F tensor G. G composed with H. There we go. Um, and that's one good way to read it. Um, one nice way to, to understand this. Um, so uh, that's an interpretation of this wiring diagram. Now I've dealt with cases here where, you know, visual ambiguities are not as obvious, but I want to come back to this rule. And what's really clever about this um, is that beyond defining these kind of common sense things, like you can swap things, it doesn't matter, you know, combining with unit is the same as not combining at all. It's kind of common sense and basic syntax. Um, 
there's something else that's deeper going on, that's deeply categorical. Um, category theory is all about the relationships. It's all about the connections. And I noted earlier, we're dealing with a bifunctor and maps morphisms to morphisms too. But it doesn't just map willy-nilly morphisms to morphisms. It maps it in a way that honors or preserves composition. So when this functor maps things, um, it maps the composition of two things over to the composition of their mappings. OK, so what am I saying? Um, well, you remember, if we had a functor, this is just this is a bifunctor, but let's, it's a functor. It's just a functor from this product category. So let's talk about functors in general. So here's a category with three objects, A, B, and C. And we have a functor F, capital F, capital. Um, so what does a functor do? Well, it maps objects to objects, great. So A is mapped to F of A, B is mapped to F of B. And C is mapped to F of C. Great, great. But it does more than that, right? I mean, the really interesting thing of what a functor does is it maps morphisms. That's really more at the heart of the matter. So it maps this morphism lower F into F, capital F, <laughs> F. Yeah, um, I'm embarrassed. Uh, uh, so uh, we, we, we map over with the functor F to this one. And it needs to go between the endpoints of, of to the mappings between its, the mappings of its endpoints. So it needs to go between FA and F me because F goes between A and B. So there it is, there it is. There's the mapping of F, great. And not surprisingly, this is the mapping of H. Great, going from FB to FC because H went from B to C. Okay, great. Nothing unusual there. But here's the, here's the rub. Here's the twist. Here's the issue. Because if we have the composition of F and H over here, H after F with this, this composition, um, if we map that over, if we do the composition over here and C, and then we map it over, we have to have it be exactly the same as FF as, as, as the composition of the mappings of F and H uh, over in D. So FH after FF, right? This is all back to the definition of functors, but it has to be nice in this way. It shouldn't matter whether we translate it in C. Um, we do the composition C in the map over or do the composition in D after mapping over, they should give the same result. Um, and so we say the functor preserves composition. It maps in a way that honors composition. It turns compositions here into co corresponding compositions here. And that's just beautiful. Um, and it allows, you know, identity morphisms here to operate similar to how they go here. And it just, it all fits together nicely. And I, you may say like, well, why am I talking about this weird factoid? Well, turns out because it's a functor, it preserves composition. You could say, yeah, well, what of it? Well, okay. So, so now we're getting more to the heart of the matter. Let's deal with this bifunctor. Mm. Bifunctor tensor. Um, so what is this dumb bifunctor? The uh, bi oh man, I, I'm going forward instead of back. A bifunctor uh, here is going from the product category into C. So okay, here's the product category and it's going into C. That's the job of the bifunctor. Uh, there it is, uh, this bifunctor. Okay, so it's mapping pairs of objects from C into C. It's mapping from this product category into C. Okay, great. So it maps A cross B into tensor AB. So this pair is mapped into the tensor of the pair, whatever that is, some object in C. And A 
and A prime B prime over here is mapped into tensor A prime B prime. And a double prime B double prime here, a pair of that is mapped into the tensor of these things. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, what of it? Well, now we talk about the key fact that functors in general preserve composition. So this functor preserves competition, composition. So um, uh, it preserves composition of the of the uh, of the morphisms. So what's a morphism here? It's F cross cross G. This is pairs of objects, and this is pairs of morphisms. So F cross G is is a morphism here, and F prime cross G prime is a morphism here, going from A prime cross B prime to A double prime cross D, B double prime. So these are single morphisms. So I just drew them out in their fulsomeness um, in an illustrative fashion. Okay. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so if we compose these, let's, let's think what happens. Oh, oh no, we compose them. We get um, here, uh, uh, this is actually, um, yeah, uh, 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 yes. Um, so uh, if, we, if we compose those, uh, these things, what we get is in the first element of it, we get F prime after F, because um, we, when we compose these, we, we just compose their components. This is F cross G. This is F prime cross G prime. When we compose them, we get F prime uh, after F in its first, we get something whose first element is F prime after F, whose second element is F is G prime after G. Uh, and it's a pair of those. That's all it is. So it's a pair of them. It turns out it's also um, F cross G uh, uh, um, composed with F prime cross G prime um, as well. But, but uh, we can write it this way. This is um, a perfectly good way to write it. The, each side of this composes. Uh, we could think of what it, it does on the left side and what it does on the right side and write it this way. Okay, so, so that's what this dotted arrow is that normally we wouldn't even draw. Great. That's the implied composition. We know this has to be in this category. There's a morphism like that because compositions of any two morphisms have to be in the category. Great. And over here in C though, this, this bifunctor has to map that composition in a way that honors it. So what is it gonna map it to? It's gotta map it to, well, ooh, well, let's look how we would map this. So this thing got mapped to um, tensor AB. This one got mapped to tensor A prime B prime. Okay. Um, this guy got mapped to tensor FG, which I'll write as F, tensor G. I could have written this as A tensor B. Could have written this as F prime tensor G prime. But basically this is F tensor G. This is, so that's what this is mapped to. That's what, this one is mapped to F prime tensor G prime. After all, this bifunctor maps the morphisms too. Um, but here's the thing, because this rule that it has to honor, honor these, these, this composition, this composition has to map to that composition. The functor has to honor it. Um, and so let's, let's see what that means. It means this thing, which we've just said is the composition here, gets mapped over into the, you know, this after that, right? This one here I've written out as F prime tensor G prime. The first version of this, so I, it was actually written this way after this way. Uh, I could have written it either way, but just so you can see it nicely, um, I thought I'd write it this way. And 
what you can see is there's this kind of um, honoring of it where uh, we have this interchangeability. It's like you can, if you imagine this cross as being the, uh, the tensor, it's like we can reorder this in either way. Um, we can, we might prefer to think of of doing this um, this tensoring over here first, uh, and then mapping over. Excuse me, doing it, um, uh, composing, and then mapping over um, after tensoring. So composing and then tensoring versus tensoring and then composing, uh, which is what we have going on here. They have to be the same. You say, well, okay. So who cares? Who cares if you can do? composition and then tensoring or tensoring and composition. Uh, okay, so maybe that's true, but what's significance of it to wiring diagrams? Well, remember, serial placement of two blocks is composition. Parallel placement of two blocks is tensoring. So what this is saying is that this diagram at once represents two things that are guaranteed to be because of this functoriality of this bifunctor, because it honors composition, there's two things that have to be the same, which is uh, F and then G tensor. Think about this thing first, tensoring after all it's in parallel with this thing, S, and then T. So we can kind of think of chunking it up, doing the whole darn upper thing, tensored the whole darn lower thing. That's one way to think about it. Perfectly legitimate, perfectly good. Um, maybe your mind finds it more convenient to deal with this kind of stringing them along and, and thinking about doing all those at once. Um, great. But what this is saying is that there's no, in fact, the ambiguity, it may seem there's no ambiguity, but it makes no difference because it's the same as visually dividing it up in this other way, where we kind of slice it vertically here. We say, no, there's, this is actually F tensor S, then, then um, composed with G tensor T, uh, which, which is another perfectly good interpretation. Um, you may remember, um, we actually saw something a little bit like this with this, right? Where we did F tensor G and then composed with H. That's what this interpretation kind of involves. Um, we kind of think of this vertical slice first, F and S. We think of things happening there as a tensor of them. And then we think of this as a tensor and we just do this latter one after this one. So we could write down the expression perfectly legitimate in either way, but they're the same in the sense that there's a, a formal natural isomorphism between them. They're the same information. It gives the same result. It's the same, um, same outcome. Um, so is there a visual ambiguity? Yes, but it doesn't matter. It gives the same results. It works the same way uh, either way. Um, uh, okay, so um, you know we could apply the same thing here. These are inspired by Brendan Fong's examples in this Applied Category Theory Lecture, um, Chapter 4, Lecture 2. Um, so if we have something like this, um, where you could be excused for saying, well, you know, this just kind of stretched F over to the, to the left in some weird way. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Um, and this shows that it doesn't matter. So we can interpret this in two ways. Uh, we can interpret this as F cross G. Um, you know, you say, oh, it doesn't matter that they stretched it. The length of the wire doesn't matter for our purposes. So it's F tensor G and then followed by H. That's exactly what we had here, right? Um, you could say it's basically that and you'd be right. But you could also say it's F tensor ID because this is ID. You remember that? 
that whole thing. This is ID. This is the ID function. It's like a block that is the identity function. Okay, okay. Um, so we can tensor this with ID and then composed with ID tensor G, it was just a stinking wire. So it's, it's ID block uh, sort of tensored with G, tensor H. And these things have to be the same by the functoriality of this darn bifunctor. The fact that the bifunctor honors composition means these things are the same. They're naturally isomorphic to each other. Uh, and you know, if you kind of look at it, you kind of say, yeah, yeah. I mean, formally, F tensor ID, what is that? Formally, by the definition of this, what is F tensor ID? Anyone? If, if ID is I, um, uh, or if, if ID is, well, F tensor ID, I'm sorry, these are morphisms here, but F tensor ID, it turns out, is just going to give something, well, actually, I shouldn't say this, I shouldn't say this, because it has this extra component here. It's in parallel with a kind of no-op. And this is a no op in parallel with G on the upper side and then fed into H. So I shouldn't say that. It's, it's not reducible to that. Um, but um, uh, here we have this, um, this formal equivalence, which says they're the same. You don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about them. Um, they're gonna give the same answer. Wade, yes, question. I'm just wondering if you go back to the previous slide, please. This one. Yeah. Do we have to specify what that ID is, the ID on, to be strict about it? Um, well, it, it map, it's a good question. Um, generally, the symmetric monoidal category for the whole diagram will be the same. Um, and so whatever value it has on here, will be the same output as was input. That's what this is saying. So this ID is mapping A to A. And so if what's circulating on the wires in general are doubles, um, it'll be mapping double, you know, it'll take in a double and return that same value double. Um, if what's circulating is an int, it'll take in an int, return that exact same int, take in seven and return seven, take in, you know, 13 and return 13 or what have you. Um, I don't know if that's uh, helpful. It's not like we have to say there's some B-ness in the thing that it takes in and returns, um, but it's what's ever on that wire. Maybe I'm exaggerating. I, I guess it's fair to say that you could have a, uh, anyway, I'm not, I'm not sure if you could have a symmetric monoidal category with this definition where different wires hold different, types um i guess you probably uh, no uh, yeah um, maybe uh, there's two sides of my mind fighting about it and i don't have time to adjudicate it right now but um, yeah that, that's fine we can we can come back yeah. to it some other time yeah um so here's a more textured diagram yeah these two visual interpretations are formally equivalent. So we can have F tensor ID. Really, I think this should be uh, ID tensor F to capture kind of the, um, um, capture the ordering there, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, and then, uh, and so, so we have this, and then there's G, tensor H um, and, uh, and, and then there's K. Um, so you can kind of think of this as a big block that takes in more inputs. And you could kind of think of this as a big block where the, fat, the top half of it just passes through things. Um, and, and you compose them together. Now, the thing that's a little bit confusing here is some things take, um, Two, some of these blocks take two things in as input. Some take 
one thing in its input, like f. Um, but we can be kind of dealing with this. So f, for example, id cross f is something which takes in a uh, two things, one for f, one for x, this kind of no op on x. And, and it outputs three things. Um, one happens to be whatever was taken in an X and then C and B. Uh, and then G and H are a block that takes in three things. Uh, and, and then we compose with, with K here. Um, so uh, it turns out that's one perfectly legitimate way to read it. Another way would be to say, uh, uh, F, F, F uh, composed with G, F and then G, uh, and then tensored with F and H. Mm. Um, uh, are, and, and then it should say, it should say K. We need a, we need a K there um, to complete it. But um, but this is is another way. Now you'll notice here that um, uh, like F G, F and then G, like th the entire composition of those, th this result is going to be something which takes in a uh, an X, and it takes in a y as well, and it produces a d. Um, and this is going to be something which, uh, this one, f and then h, it's going to be something which takes in a y. Uh, it, it takes in a y, uh, and, and it outputs an e. Uh, and the fact that these are tensored together means you'll have sort of this one and then that one, and also fed into K to get whatever answer it gives. So these are two ways of, of looking at this diagram that give the same answer that have to because of this functoriality. It may seem weird that this is the case, but it's all about honoring the, um, the 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 tensoring and honoring the, uh, the or it's honoring the composition most importantly. So we can either uh, tensor and then compose or compose and then tensor uh, within these these categories. Okay, um, and the the final thing I'll say here is uh, that these diagrams are. Uh, themselves morphisms, and uh, that's not obvious. We can think of it in the context of hypergraph categories that represent, um, that allow us to represent these, um, but they compose. And we could think of them as what are called typed operads, um, which compose in, 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 you know, in a very, very nice, nice way. By, uh, by nesting. So the idea here, if we have this diagram and this diagram here, we can take what's ever in this diagram to the left and place it into, by composing it um, with this diagram, we sort of plunk it into the eye. And that, sort of expands in there to have everything that was in here where uh, one was. So I said it to I, but I meant to one. Um, so this is one becomes this diagram and it's linked into two. So it sort of collapses it down as it were. Um, it, it treats this as being inside of here and then it breaks the boundaries. And uh, that allows us to kind of reason about successive nesting and collapsing them down. And this is going to be front and center when it comes to 
certain parts of the discussion on polynomial functors. Um, it's precisely this ability to substitute in, um, which I think is, is intriguing. Um, you might think it's kind of sticking them in end to end, but here it's actually substitution in of this is the wiring diagrams. And there's this really intriguing paper, which if any of you were looking for, you know, project fodder, um, this is a this is an interesting paper called Wiring Diagrams as Normal Forms for Computing and Symmetric Mineral Categories. And it's by a familiar cast of characters. Evan Patterson is working with our group now um, and with uh, Xiao Yan um, and David Spivak, uh, uh, who, who you know through the, the videos um, and one other author. Um, but they they have this introduction to wiring diagrams and talk about uh, their their roles. And uh, it turns out the wiring diagrams will just pop up in all sorts of places associated with the symmetric mineral categories and associated with dynamical systems in particular. Uh, so uh, symmetric mineral categories provide us this language which can be translated or transliterated directly into these wiring diagrams, given a, a, a formula in symmetric uh, monoidal category notation, we can create a wiring diagram for it or vice versa. And the software Shayan is building on the uh, CatLab software will do exactly that. So you have a wiring diagram that kind of is, is the notation a graphical notation for this written characterization with tensors written down and composition. And the point is that these are mutually supportive because the, the wiring diagrams allow you to understand this, um, this expression while visual ambiguities are defined so that they don't, they don't matter, they're moot um, given the rules of these categories. And it's, it's these kind of nice rules that we have that have their visual analogs, plus the fact that we have this compositionality associated with, uh, that's preserved. Um, we, we honor composition in this functor. Um, so, so wiring diagrams um, uh, have this very basic foundational useful rule that means they're, they're not merely eye candy. They're a way of characterizing these systems and they have categories associated with them, which are really orderly and um, which have these nice operations, which are visually meaningful, like nesting things, which can be represented visually. Chayan is working on categories like this for stock and flow diagrams, uh, for system dynamics um, diagrams and uh, we have there the ability to link them in um, that, that she's been working on with, uh, with flows or with informational connections is the hope. And then ultimately, I think we will substitute in hierarchical, hierarchically. So you might have a diagram of stages of COVID-19 infection that you substitute for the I stock of a stock and flow model to get, you know, a, a a stock which, which essentially consists of several stages of infection. Um, anyway, um, some ideas, but wiring diagrams are gonna be with us for the balance of the course as a fundamental tool. And we'll see them next time because they're linked in with prisms. Um, and I mentioned this last time, but there's some rules with wiring diagrams in terms of the connections, how we connect things, the output and the inputs and what they can be connected to that we'll capture with wiring diagrams. Okay, so that is all for today. Um, hopefully that will interest you in what's coming up uh, for the close of the discussion of profunctor optics uh, and position us for getting into the, um, uh, the material on polynomial functors representing dynamical systems. So thank you very much, everyone, and hope that uh, it's of interest. Take care there.